This is Shopify Masters, the e-commerce marketing podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs. It's powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. To get an extended 30-day trial, visit shopify.com slash masters. Hey entrepreneurs, my name is Felix and I'm the host of the Shopify Masters podcast. Each week we put out podcast interviews with successful e-commerce entrepreneurs or experts to give you inspiration, motivation, and actionable tips to increase your traffic and sales so your store can generate the sales you need to live the life you want. On the last episode, the team for WallsNeedLove.com revealed that 93% of their social traffic comes from Pinterest. In this episode, you'll hear from an entrepreneur that went from e-commerce to opening up a physical store. In this episode, you'll learn how to sell face-to-face when you're not used to it, what to do if you're selling products that you're not passionate about but your customers are, and what's involved in the buying process when running a retail store. Today, I'm joined by Kayleen Leonard from CoquetteCouture.com. That's C-O-Q-U-E. T-T-E-C-O-U-T-U-R-E.com. Coquette is a Sioux Falls boutique featuring hand-picked women's clothing of eclectic style. It was started in 2012. Welcome, Kayleen. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to have you on. So tell us a little bit more about your story and what are some of the most popular products that you sell? Yeah, so our store is definitely, I guess, for people who've never um, been in our store, it kind of has a very anthropology type of vibe. Um, as far as what we kind of go for, um, the look of it. So I would say it's vintage inspired, um, with modern, you know, takes on, you know, old looks. So our, our huge thing for us is, um, our boots. So, um, they're called bed stew. They're an amazing brand for us. Um, and they're all handmade, which is super, super cool. I mean, you can look over on the bottom and you can see the nail marks and, um, all that stuff. So, we definitely, definitely love leather and think that, you know, there are certain pieces that you need to invest in. So that's kind of our big thing that we're definitely known for is, you know, our leather handbags and leather shoes and stuff like that. Everything else is kind of just, it kind of fills in. I would say, we like to say that we're for the free spirited wild child and it can be anywhere from, you know, we've had a fifth grader in the store and she was like the cutest thing and had like $5 in coins paying for stuff. Otherwise we've had like a 92 year old woman buy a sweater. So we're kind of here, there and everywhere. Um, but yeah. Very cool. So you, uh, this is, you know, just to be clear, you have uh, obviously an e-commerce store, the, the domain yep. we talked about, but also a physical store. Uh, so right. how did you get started? Like, what was the idea? You know, what was your background? Like, were you always into business? Like, were you always an entrepreneur? Yeah. So I actually, my dad is an entrepreneur, um, but his business is construction. Um, so I feel like I kind of had that bug and I think I grew up kind of getting it for the most part. Um, and then I went to college, um, here in South Dakota, South Dakota state university, and they had an entrepreneurial program. So when I went to college, I, you know, I did the regular college thing where I messed around for about three years and then I was like, crap, I need to graduate soon. So, um, I really got into it and I fell absolutely head over heels in love with like the creative part of it. Um, so Coquette actually started, because in order to graduate college, like most kids have to do like thesis or whatever based on their major. Um, for my major, we had to create a business. And so it didn't necessarily have to be real. But I figured if I'm doing, you know, a full-blown business plan with real financials and, I mean, everything has to balance and make sense, what's the point in making, you know, a hot chocolate stand that just didn't make sense? Um, so the idea kind of started there. And then from that it was actually only supposed to be e-commerce. We were never supposed to have a storefront um, was the whole idea behind it. Um, and so I pitched it to my parents and I'm very blessed to have, you know, a really strong group of people behind me that are supportive. And so pitched it to them and I started it in college and, um, we started e-commerce immediately, um, almost five years ago. So, I mean, you think about it, the internet's so different now and I don't think people realize it, how different it is and how much it's changed in five years. So we started it online and then, you know, after a while we just didn't, I mean, I just did entrepreneurial studies. I didn't do marketing. I didn't do anything like that. Social media wasn't that huge. I mean, everyone had Facebook, but beyond that, I mean, it wasn't, especially in the Midwest, it wasn't a huge thing. Um, so then I started kind of 
kind of realizing and figuring out that I needed to get an anchor. I needed to have a spot just because that, that made it feel more real. Um, Mm -hmm. so that's what I did. I, we, I went all over, we, I did parties and shoot parties with women that, you know, are friends of my parents. And I went into a mall for a little bit in a kiosk, which was probably the sketchiest decision I think I've ever made. Um, did that for a little bit. Um, and then finally I decided like it was time I needed to open up a store. So I decided to do a brick and mortar, um, about three years ago. Mm-hmm. So you, did you, I guess how much of the, of the business that you have planned out? Because I think a lot of listeners, you know, might be in school, might be in business school, either undergrad or graduate school. And I think for a lot of schools like yours, they have this, like you're saying, major project at the end of it where you have to conceptually build a business, but you actually went further than that. So how much of it did you, you know, have planned out in college that you was actually useful from that program that you were in? Everything. So everything that I used in college, the business plan that I originally had in college was the one that I presented to a banker um, while I was still in college. So actually the program was is really great. And, you know, the whole entire program, all you do is build business plans. That's pretty much what they teach you. And so they have um, they have different classes that we would take. Um, and we actually pitched our businesses, regardless if they're real or fake, to actual business, mm. successful businessmen. Um, in the Midwest that came to like this conference and I didn't win actually. I'm pretty sure it was all men and I'm pretty sure they just kind of like laughed at me and thought it was the dumbest idea ever, which I mean, I don't blame them. I'm pretty sure there's like some farmers and like, I know there's like some big construction guys and stuff like that, but no, I was, as soon as I had it done, I was essentially, I was ready to go. The only thing that probably wasn't ready is they didn't have a focus of e-commerce that was kind of something that I was going into absolutely blind. Um, and so that was the only thing as far as like the business and building um, that and getting that going and, you know, knowing who to talk to and financing and stuff like that. I, w- I was very solid with that, but the actual e-commerce, again, because it was five years ago, wasn't a huge thing. So when I told people, yeah, I'm going to do just an e-commerce, they're like, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard of. Now, I feel like if you would go tell people that, they, they would be like, oh, yeah, that's totally normal. Everyone yeah. does that because it's so common. Um, but, yeah, I was kind of at the front end of that. And I, I think I, I missed the mark. I think if I would have been, you know, a little later, I, it would have just killed it. But it's just, yeah, it's just one of those things. But as far as a program, if you can get into something like that, yeah, that's, that's definitely the way to go for sure. So this business plan that you uh, created coming out of this program, you said that you presented to a banker. Like, was this to get uh, capital or is it just part of the course? Yeah, no, it was to get capital because after I was like, crap, now I need money for inventory. Like, because essentially what we were doing in the beginning was um, I was going to, (laughs) so if you've ever been to South Dakota, which I'm sure you haven't, there's not a lot of luxury, like nice brands. Like, we don't have a Nordstrom, we don't have a Dillard's, we, like, and Dillard's isn't nice. We don't have a Bloomingdale's, we don't have a Saks. We have nothing. So, I wanted to bring in, you know, Italian shoes. I wanted to bring in, you know, beautiful other pieces and heels and, you know, try to class it up a little bit. Not saying it's not classy here, but <laughs> just stuff that you would see on the East and West Coast that's really, really common that you don't see here. Um, and so, that was the goal. So, I knew I needed to have inventory because we couldn't do dropship internationally, like that. Um, so yeah, I, I originally went to a banker and I honestly showed it to him and he laughed and thought it was, again, this is, this is one thing that I came across and I'm not being sexist at all. I think it's just cause I was, you know, I was 21 years old at the time and it was just this 21 year old girl going into a bank. Um, and a man who usually, I mean, he's my dad's banker. So he deals with huge construction companies and stuff like that. So I'm sure me coming in, I just looked like a I had no idea what I was doing and I, I probably didn't. Um, so he pretty much told me and the bank told me there's no way that they're going to give me any money. I needed um, at least a year under my belt of solid sales in order for them to even consider it. So my next option, and they warned us in college over and over and over again, do not use family and friends. Whatever you do, do not use family and friends. I feel like every book you might read about business, um, they'll probably say do not use family and friends. Um, but I used family and friends <laughs> and I still have good relationships. It was mostly, you know, my dad really, really helped me. And 
to this day, I'm still paying him back. But um, that was, you know, I was lucky enough to get in with him. Now, I feel like they have more opportunities. There's so many angel investors. And that's something that, you know, I still go back and I, I talk to my old college and I talked to a couple, like a conference. And, you know, that's one thing that they've mentioned is they've they've brought more people into because it's hard when you first start off for a someone to take you seriously and b for someone to give you money. It's just it's near impossible. So, that's, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you, you know, like you're saying, you didn't get money from from the bankers. You you were able to uh, get some money from friends and family. Your your dad. Uh, you took this money and you went to buy inventory. And was this after that? Was that when you uh, mentioned that you went to these mall kiosks, the private parties, set up booths? Was that after you bought the inventory with the capital? Yeah. Yep. So I, so this all happened in like a three month span. So I graduated college in December and then in from, you know, from, I think it was like August when I started school until December. So my last semester, everything was getting done. And so in that time I was ordering product, ordering inventory. And then come January is when I actually went into, I think our first, the first kiosk, which was in Sioux Falls. Um, and you know, that was probably, that's just a great story in general because, you know, I didn't really realize like importing and exporting and all the costs that were involved in that. So we essentially like got involved with these Italian companies and, you know, there's a huge time difference. And I think they especially thought I was kind of a joke. (laughs) So they definitely took advantage of how naive I was. And, you know, that's one thing that I think, you know, anybody who's listening, you're going to learn is you may even act like you have it all together, but they're not stupid. And so I had to pay just an asinine amount of money to import that stuff into the United States once it got to the border and, or once it got to New York. And um, yeah, so I definitely was not prepared for any of that. And that's definitely, looking back, that was probably a huge mistake I made, but it's a good lesson. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we had all this inventory from Italy that, I mean, these weren't expensive shoes. They were you know, up, upwards of anywhere 350 to 400 bucks. And I'm in a kiosk in the mall trying to sell it. So uh, looking back, yeah, the business plan wasn't the best idea. It was more of like the e-commerce thing. And we didn't really, I mean, if you look back, Shopify is just like absolutely amazing. And it makes a building a site so easy. It makes using it so easy. Whereas five years ago, they had to code everything. Mm-hmm. Like you had to code at the cart, you had to do everything. So a website back then cost, oh God, I would say 10 times the amount that it costs now. Yeah. So everything that I had built up to that point, I mean, my expenses were so, so high. So that's why we left just e-commerce because I'm like, okay, we got to make some sales. We need to do stuff. We were making random sales here, there and everywhere. Um, But like I said, I didn't really do like any of the marketing. So I was learning the Google analytics and AdWords and all that stuff. I was kind of doing it by myself and flying by the seat of my pants and um, definitely wasn't the best planned out way to go. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how I started and it went like that until, I mean, I think I did that for almost six months, eight mm-hmm. months. Yeah, what did you, what did you learn from this experience? Like selling in person <laughs> to these kiosks? Because a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs that I have on this podcast or that I talk to, they learn a lot from this, I guess, starting off face to face with their customers. Like, what did you learn from it? Um, one thing we learned is Sioux Falls does not like heels. Women (laughs) in Sioux Falls do not wear heels. It's not a cool thing. Um, and not only that, they just didn't really understand the difference between, I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of them didn't understand the difference between, you know, a nice leather handmade shoe versus, you know, a shoe that you're going to go get at Journeys or something. You know what I mean? They didn't really, um, grasp that. I Mm -hmm. think it's changed now, but, um, I think that's one thing I learned. And so it was essentially what I had to do was master my product because going and selling face to face, it's like, that was a huge challenge for me. And I, now I'm like queen of sales. Like, I feel like I could sell a dirty diaper at this point. (laughs) (laughs) Like I feel like I have it under control, but just starting off when I, you know, I'm really insecure about it. It's honestly the best advice I can give is when you're selling face to face is just know your product and the one thing that I've learned from day one is not, and I'm not saying this in every aspect of sales, but there's obviously different type of sales. The one that works best for retail, I a hundred percent feel is, you know, 
we, every customer I've met, I have customers that I met in a kiosk how many years ago that still shop with me today. And it took, I mean, all of us have walked in a mall and there's people in the kiosk and they're yelling at you to come over. And um, that was a huge thing to get past is how do you come across authentic and not like you're trying to rip somebody off. Um, So that was a huge thing. And so it was definitely just, I mean, our product was beautiful, but it was, um, it was just talking to people. And my mom actually, um, she's in this with me. So I own it. She, I call her like a, she's like a intern. So (laughs) she does like all the book work. She does the stuff I don't want to do. And then she gets free clothes and everything on top of it. That's so funny. But she was with me. So our huge thing was, it was kind of a mother daughter thing. So you know, people would walk by. Obviously, I feel like we looked a little more trustworthy, but we we never bombarded people. We never, you know, went across like that. If you wanted to talk to us, we'll talk to you and be nice to you. And, you know, we want people to feel like we're their friend because we want people to feel comfortable with us. That's just, I mean, that's just how it is. And I would never, um, I think sales, that's anything beyond that and is anything but authentic. I just don't see anyone ever coming back. And I think that the thing that I loved and that I learned the most is literally customers are king. And I think everyone knows that and says that, but I can say for a fact, because I mean, I I have five women who took a chance on me in Sioux Falls and a couple when I had a kiosk in Des Moines that still come and shop with me either online or in store. So, I mean, it's still kind of cool that, you know, I have a couple of those girls that trusted me and, you know, you know, for anyone out there that is thinking about this or maybe is forced to, I guess, sell face to face at first that are not comfortable with it, that haven't gotten started, which sounds like the situation that you were in. Any tips on how to, I guess, not necessarily build up confidence, but just to get over that mental hurdle? Talk to people like they're your friend. And I think that was the biggest thing is I was, I think when I first started, I was like, oh, I got to sell and I got to sell. And the thing is, is like when that's the first thing on your mind, people they know. People know when you're trying to sell to them. And unless they're in the mood to buy, they're just going to brush you off. And so I think that it really helps to be a people person and be very personable. So that's number one. If you don't have that, that's something that I'm not saying that you won't be a good salesperson, but you're going to constantly have to work at it um, in order to you know, get to that level where you can just go talk to anybody. And if they don't want to buy from you, that's totally fine. They may not want to buy from you today, But if you keep a good relationship, they may come back and buy tomorrow. So I think the biggest thing is, is you may feel so uncomfortable, but try your hardest just to pretend they're your mom or, you know what I mean? Pretend they're a friend and you're just talking to somebody else and it's not, you know, you got to make rent at the end of the month. You can't put that pressure on yourself because you're just, it's not going to, it's not going to come across authentic. Customers can tell. 100%. 100%. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think uh, when we talk about sales, it's a, it seems to be like a high pressure uh, activity where you got to get something out of the person. And, you know, it's almost like a, a game where you have to win something from them. Uh, and that really puts like almost like the wrong kind of tints on the experience like you're saying you want to be authentic you don't want to put that pressure on yourself because it will spill out and the things you talk about and your mannerisms and all that so i think that's uh, you know great advice so authenticity was one thing you mentioned the second thing you mentioned about uh being able to sell in person well is to really know your product so what, what does this mean exactly i mean you're not talking about knowing how it's made or knowing like what, what exactly do you mean by knowing your product like how do you how deep do you have to get or how well, i guess what you know, what does that mean to you? I mean, knowing your product, yeah, I think it's really important. Like, I could sit there and, I mean, this has gone over time. I can sit there and show you how a boot is made. I can sit there and show you, I mean, five years later, I can sit there and show you, you know, you know, this garment puckers here. Well, this is why, this zipper. I mean, there's multiple things that I can do now. Um, but what I'm saying is, so, for instance, for me, um, every item that comes in, in the store, I try it on. And so that way, when I'm putting stuff online, I always put, you know, this item's true to size, size down, size up, do a half size down in the shoe. Um, if you, for instance, like our denim, if you dry your denim, um, go ahead and don't size down, go with your regular size. I mean, I just, when I say know your product, it's so much easier to sell something that you love than sell something that you have no intention. So I have so much respect, respect for people who can sell something that they absolutely hate. Like, I don't know how you do that. I worked in men's fashion for a little bit and 
you know, it's not that I hated men's fashion. It's just I didn't have a passion for it, and I mm-hmm. guess I didn't really care, and there wasn't a driving force. Whereas um, for me and, and what I do is knowing my product is helping me, A, make a sale, but B, I just think women can really tell, like, when we get an email and saying, hey, I saw this online, how does this fit? I can personally say, hey, I've tried that on. You know, I'm 5'6", I'm this build, you know, depending on that, that's what I would compare it on. So I know a lot of online boutiques, for instance, they put it on models and they base it on model sizes. So one thing for Coquette is we don't do like models, like any girls that you see on our site, they're all local girls. They're all friends of friends. They're not, they're not these big models. Um, we really don't, I mean, really don't pay them. They just kind of do it for fun and that's the type of thing that we want is we want people to see a normal person and how it's going to fit. And so I think when I say know your product, you need to know the ins and outs of how it's going to fit, how it's made. You, you need to know the whole overview of it, not just, you know, this is the stitch and this is the fabric. Um, but that does help. So is this, uh, knowing your product, is this more so that you're confident in selling? Are people actually coming up to you and asking you, how is this made? Like, how Do they come to you and ask you all these details about the product? Or is it more for yourself to know and then that helps with your selling, just like, I guess, internally? Um, honestly, you'd be surprised how many questions I get of women asking fabrics. And um, I, did, I took an, a textiles class, for instance in college so I know like the very very basics but yeah I think there's so much there's so many questions that I feel like knowing your product it sounds so much better when you actually know the answer rather than saying you know I don't know because it sounds like you don't care when you Mm -hmm. say you don't know so I think that's why it's so important to know your product yes internally it does help you sell because you're confident but on the outside when someone asks you a question you know how does this fit I don't have to think off the top of my head and try to lie I can flat out say, you know, I think this item, you know, fits better on a a woman that, you know, isn't as, you know, doesn't have as many curves. I think this fits, you know what I mean? So I, I think yes, internally, I think it does help with confidence and I think it does help you sell it better. But I also think it makes you look more credible if you know your product. If you Mm -hmm. don't know your product, I don't know how you would expect to sell anything unless you are literally the best BSer ever. Um, so. Yeah, some people are, but yeah. some people are, and that's great. But I'm not. I'm too honest. No, I think for most people, especially people that are listening, are going to have to pick something that they're actually passionate about. And yeah. you know, speaking of that, you know, you mentioned that all the products, all the brands that you store that you have in your catalog are products that that you know you like and that you've tried on. Uh, but what about like products that you think your customers would like, but maybe you're not yeah. so much of, of a fanatic about it? Do you would you still stock that, or how would you approach that situation? Yeah. So okay. So we do carry stuff in the store that I I wouldn't. It isn't my style. I'm not saying that I would never wear it. I'm not saying that it's ugly. I'm just saying it's not my style. I'm a jean and t-shirt girl all day, every day. So like the really you know pretty dresses, like that's not me. I think we have so many customers um, and I've listened to our customers and I kind of know what our customers really want as well as the trends that are in the industry. Now, in that same breath, the trends in the industry don't look good on everybody. And I feel like with our store, what I say that, you know, I I can't sell something I don't like, it's I'm not going to sell something just because it's a trend. I'm not going to sell something that I can't stand behind um, that, you know, I don't feel that our customers would want. So it's a little bit of both. And like I said, my mom, she goes buying with me. So, you know, I'm, I'm only 26. She's, she's going to kill me. She's upper fifties. <laughs> so <laughs> we have a nice blend. Um, you know, I'll go a little trendier and she goes, you know, a little more conservative and we have a nice mixture in here. So I'm not saying, you know, only buy what you like or only buy what you want because, again, there's a lot of stuff in the store that I that aren't in my closet. Um, but it takes a little bit kind of to get to know your customers, but at the same time, you need to have your own authentic look where people who love how you look and how you style things is the main focus. So on the side, I do styling for people, and I, I've styled, I mean, I've styled every age, and I've styled every body type, and again, it's that type of thing where I can't pick out for them what I would wear unless that's their style. So it's really about 
seeing the big picture of it all, which is the hardest part and seeing, you know, do I think my customers will like this? And if they don't, you just got to suck it up and put it on sale, get rid of it, learn the lesson and don't buy it again. Um, but it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's hit or miss. It's gambling for sure. I mean, I, I haven't mastered at this point, I feel like, but there'll be times where I'll buy stuff and I'm like, oh, people are going to go crazy for it. And, and there's still four sitting on the shelf and I'm super confused by it. Um, and you never, you never know for sure, but. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about that because I think that this is a situation that a lot of storeners get into where they maybe haven't done a ton of market research or maybe they have, but they still you know, end up picking the wrong products to add to their catalog. And it just kind of sits around for a long time you know, in their warehouse, in their apartment, or wherever they have it, and on the, the site itself. So how do you know when it's time to discount the product then sell it and get rid of it really quickly and then move on? Like, What, what criteria do you look at or what, I guess, feeling or hopefully there's some kind of quantitative thing you can look at too to determine that it's time to move on? So... We're kind of blessed into the point where we sell. So I, I'll say it this way. We carry a very limited quantity, and we do that on purpose, um, and that kind of makes us different. And some boutiques, you know, they carry a lot of one thing. We want people to have their own unique style. We don't want a million other people to have the same thing. So sometimes that, you know, comes back and bites us in the butt because we might sell out of something literally in three hours and I refuse to rebuy it because I don't want to upset the customers who bought it. I might go get it in another color, but I'm not going to go get the same exact thing. So a lot of the time we end up in a situation where, and this is more common than not, is we end up with a piece and we only have one size left. And that is the most annoying thing for anybody in retail when you have one piece left. And so what we try to do is I'll give it, I have a 30 day rule. So in 30 days, if we haven't seen any traffic to it, if we haven't seen it moving, what we'll do in store is we'll move it. And we have to do the same thing online as we'll move it. We might take it offline. We might take it and, you know, hide it for a little bit and put it back on because a lot of it is based on timing. It's not necessarily the product. It's just what people are buying or, you know, you might have 10 really amazing items and so people are only gravitating towards three of them. You know the other ones are going to sell. It's just you need to put them in at different times. And so we won't mark things down after 30 days, but after 30 days we have to go back and look and see, you know, what's going on. If it makes it 30 days, chances are it's not going to. Um, chances are after 30 days we might have one piece left. And when one piece is left after 30 days, we put it, you know, on discount just to get rid of it. And then we move along because the main thing in retail that people have to realize and the main thing that I think my biggest lesson was it's all working capital. And so you're not making any money, whether it sits there 30 days or, you know, whether it sits there for three months because it's not selling. So you need to do what you need to do to get rid of it. I'm not saying you need to lose money on it, but if it comes to that point where you're going to have to lose a little money on it to get rid of it, to get working capital, you're going to have to do what you have to do. And that's just business. Um, so that, that's kind of what it comes down to. I don't think there's really like a quantitative, like there's not like a formula that you can do because it's all based on, you know, the project, the product itself. And sometimes you put stuff out at the wrong time or sometimes you put stuff online at the wrong time. You really, really have to just, I'm not saying mess with your customers, but you really have to change it up and um, keep it fresh and something like there's been multiple times where I'll put something online and it'll sit there and nobody notices. I'll take it off for a week and I'll put it back on and it'll just sell like crazy. Hmm. So there's little things like that that you can do. And it's almost, um, people, people are lazy. I'm not going to lie. Mm-hmm. And anybody who's into retail or getting into business is going to find that out when they're selling a product. People are lazy. And so you constantly have to keep putting it in their face. So, also, another thing when we do, um, we do a lot of Instagram. So social media is huge for us, which I'm sure we're going to get into. And um, so if something's not selling, it's because, A, the picture wasn't good. B, they need to see it styled. Or C, they simply don't like it. So those are kind of the things that we need to go through in order to figure out whether we're going to put it on sale or not. So. Okay, makes sense. So let's talk about the the buying process. So you mentioned that you and your mother go out and, and 
just start looking for products. By the way, what is the actual process? Like, how do you begin to look for <laughs> things, uh, new products to, to carry? Like, what, what is it like? So the beginning is probably the hardest part because you're finding new brands. Um, so there's shows that, I mean, in retail specifically, um, but it's not even clothing. There's accessory so- shows, there's tech shows, there's shows all over that you can attend whatever your specialty is or whatever your business is. Um, so you attend the show. Um, for instance, gosh, I think the Las Vegas show has like 80,000 people. Like it's just a huge thing. And so you essentially just walk around and go and find brands that catch your eye. Um, and then once you find that brand, you have to check price point, make sure the price point is right. Once you check price point, you have to find out if, for us, since we have both a brick and mortar and the online store, we have to find out if there's any one local that carries it to see if we can carry it because there's a lot of um, zip code issues that run into it. So a lot of brands, your zip code protected. So same brand as you within a five mile radius or something like that. And so when you have an online store and an in-store, it kind of crosses over. So they won't sell to you even if you're like, oh, I'll just put it on my online store. Some might, but you're going to run into a ton of issues um, that way. So I recommend just not even getting involved because there are so many brands. And if you find one you love and you can't get it, chances are in a month there's going to be another brand that's launched that you're going to love just as much. So that's kind of what it is. You, I mean, you go figure out what brands you like. And so for us, we try to hit every girl, every brand I think we have in here hits a, a different woman speaks a different voice. And so that's the huge thing for us was finding those different brands and finding those different women, but still tying it all together. And so, um, it's definitely, <laughs> it's definitely exhausting. I think that's probably, you know, my least favorite part of this job, which I think any girl that listens to this or any guy that wants to get in retail, is like, Oh my gosh, that sounds like the most fun. It does. It does sound like the most fun but you're going to end up hating it um, just because it's such a pain. But the nice thing is, is once you get your brands, once you go to the shows and once you feel like you have, you know, a good flow going throughout your online store and in store and um, all that, then you can just go, you like your, your reps will send you line sheets and you like, I can just sit at my computer. So we're ordering for next summer right now. Um, so I'll just sit at my computer and go through and, you know, yes, no, yes, no. And then I'll email them and we'll do it that way. Um, but the beginning, yeah, it's hard. And a lot of the time in, in retail, you're going to have to deal with switching stuff up. Cause if you first start out, you're going to find out some brands do not sell that you thought were going to sell amazing. And that, you know, that's just something you have to just change. And that's why, you know, a lot of the time when you can do a minimum order, do a minimum order, see how it's going to go and then move that way. Um, I've made that mistake. Um, we had a brand and I went crazy over it. And this was when we first started off and, um, it was, it was my style. It was just a t-shirt and I was just like, Oh yeah, this is great. And I, I went crazy and we're still, I mean, it's, it is completely discounted down to nothing and we're still trying to sell some of it. And that's a mistake that you're going to make in retail and that's just how it works. Um, so yeah, it's a process. It's a lot more work than people initially realize it actually is. So you said that, um, you should always start with the the most, I guess the minimum order that you can get away with, even if you're paying more for it, like, and then see what happens. Yeah, honestly, I I would rather pay 50 cents more a top or, and a lot of the time they're not going to, unless you're a huge company, they're not going to give you that great of a deal. They might give you free shipping, which I mean, free shipping is awesome because if you have to pay for shipping, you have to figure that out in the price of your item. But, um, unless you're, you know, Shields or, you know, Anthropology or Nordstrom, they're not going to give you a huge discount, um, and for us, like I said, we order very limited quality quantities, but we order multiple styles. Um, so just to start off, yeah, it makes more sense. If you get a brand in and it just blows up, then yeah, have at it. You know, go go crazy with it. I know that there are certain boutiques that only carry one brand, and that's perfectly fine for them. And they, you know, they found a niche. That's essentially finding your niche. And um, it's, it's taken off, but to be on the safe side, I think it's just best to 
start small. I feel like the biggest mistake you can make in business is getting in over your head. And then what do you do then? And I've, I've learned that. And I think a lot of people, if you ask a lot of business owners, they've learned the same thing is you start getting a little cocky and you, you know, find a couple of brands that work one in and you're like, Oh yeah, I'm really good at this. And then all of a sudden you're like, what did I just do? Um, so start small, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I want to talk about this about getting in over your head because in the the context that we're talking about right now is about you know buying too much inventory up front. But are there other examples that maybe not financially related that you when you get in over your head? Like, do you have any examples that that you I guess lessons you've learned about I guess diving in too much, um, but maybe not necessarily around buying inventory? Yeah, so you I mean you can do the same, for instance, with like a retail space. I mean, for us if you're going to go brick and mortar. You can do the same thing online. So for instance, um, there with Shopify, there's so many apps and like, I love apps. I get really excited over apps. It's like, Ooh, this is going to make my like life super easy. But the thing is, is like, and what I have to calm myself down on is, can I do this myself? Do I really need to pay this much a month when it's something super silly where like, there's a bunch of like shipping ones for us where you can, you know, you can use UPS and FedEx and all these different shipping options and it weighs it for you and all that stuff. And I get that works for certain businesses, but for us, I'm small enough where I can do that, you know, either all by myself or me, myself, and maybe two employees, um, or me, my mom and two employees. So that's definitely stuff that you can do. Um, or I mean, just even, I know a lot of people who do like subscriptions or anybody who has like a store front, they have all these business associations, for instance, you can join. So you have to pay all these fees up front and then you're part of this like association. And the thing is, is what I learned is like, I think when you go into that, you're like, oh, this is a great idea. And you don't utilize it and you're wasting all that money on stuff that you could be a putting in inventory or, you know, revamping your site or marketing or, you know what I mean? There's multiple things that you could be doing um, other than, you know, pretending to meet up with people. And that was a huge thing for us too is, you know, there's a bunch of chamber of commerce is a huge thing. And I know they have online groups that you can join too. And my whole thing is, is if if you have to pay for stuff like that, just don't do it, especially as a startup. If you have to pay a certain amount of money, um, to, to do a simple task. I'm trying to think of a simple task right now. Um, like prior to Shopify having, um, you, uh, USPS available, like you had to go separate and go to USPS, like the site and make your own labels. Um, cause that's just like a thing they just started offering what six months ago, maybe. Yeah. And so they had apps that you could buy and they were anywhere from 20 bucks a month to, you know, 200 bucks a month. And it's just like, I think you don't think about that, but you think in a whole year, 20 bucks a month, I mean that all of that adds up when you can just sit there and suck it up and do it yourself. So I think of a lot of it is when I say getting in over your head, there's just so much that you can just do. And the thing is, is what I learned is keep it simple, (laughs) keep it as cheap and as simple as possible. Because when you start as a business, you need every cent. That's just, that's just how it is. So, so what if you are going too slow though? Like, how do what do you ask yourself to figure out if the when you're approaching a decision to pay or invest in something or not, if it's actually necessary or not? You know, because at a certain point, your time is going to be more valuable than uh, than sitting there and putting together packages, right? So, how do you make that determination that it's time now to pay up? You know, I think that there'll there'll be a time when you realize it. For instance, here's my example. I, for the longest time, I did all the marketing here. I did all the social media. I did everything. I did the blog posts. I did, I did everything. I took the pictures. Um, I did the editing. I did everything myself. And I got to a point where I felt like, like, you know what? This isn't my specialty. This isn't something that I, you know, I'm okay at. I'm not fantastic at it though. And I think it came a point where, you know, I would much rather pay someone to do it and not have that headache. So for instance, I mean, even shipping and stuff, there's going to be a point where you're going to get so busy. And for us, there's been points where I'm like, you know what, I can't do this anymore. And you have to delegate it. And I think that's the huge 
huge thing for business owners because I feel like a lot of the time business owners all have the same mind where they're very micromanagers. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge trait that I hate of me that I'm very much a micromanager. And so as far as getting an app and doing stuff like that or, or paying for a service, I think you know when to turn it over when you feel like you're not giving 100% to everything. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So for me, I can I couldn't give 100% to being in the store and being in sales because I was worried about being at the computer and editing because I had to put stuff up online. And so it got to a point where I was like, you know what, what am I good at? What are my specialties? What is, you know, my gift? And what do I need to pass off? So that's kind of what it is. And, you know, it could be something you pass off to another person. It could be something you pass off to an app. Um, But again, if you're that busy where you're that, you know, kind of frazzled and you're everywhere, then, yeah, you probably can afford to get either Mm -hmm. a marketing firm or get an app or get another employee. I mean, you're going to see that across businesses, you know, for the longest time. I, I worked here in the storefront for a year straight, didn't have an employee, didn't take a vacation, didn't take a day off. And it got to the point where, you know, we were making enough money and I'm like, okay, I'm going crazy. Like I'm going to lose it. I seriously need to have like, I don't know, at least like two days a week where I can clean my house or, you know, do something. Mm-hmm. And so you, you, th- you'll get to a point where you just know. Yeah, well, let's talk about the the store then, the physical store. So what was that transition like? So you went through this phase where it sounds like you did offline first with the kiosk and everything, went <laughs> online, then you went back uh, offline again. Yeah. So what was the, I guess, what was the thinking behind that? Because I think earlier you said something, something really interesting, which was that e-commerce didn't feel real enough, where you didn't have something that you could walk into, that you could hold in your hands and see in front of you. So tell us about that. Tell us about why you made the decision to transition into, I mean, you obviously still have both now, but what made you open a store and what was the process like? Right. So when I say we were initially really e-commerce, we were e-commerce this whole entire time. We've never not had a website Um, so when we were in the kiosk, we even had a website. It was, it was up there. It was just, wasn't bringing in enough sales. Mm -hmm. So, um, we had this website and we had it designed. And at the time it was just like this beautiful thing. And I was so proud of it. Um, and realistic wise, then all of a sudden mobile started becoming this huge thing of being on your phone, being on your iPad and shopping via that way instead of at a computer. So five years ago when we did it, that wasn't a huge thing for, you know, for a website to be mobile friendly. Um, So we had our website. It wasn't mobile friendly. It wasn't inventory friendly. It was with another company. Obviously, it wasn't with Shopify. Um, So we had the store for about a year and a half. And then when I figured out, you know, the store can kind of stand on its own. I don't need to, you know, baby this as much anymore. We need to, we need to focus online. Um, I then found Shopify. So last June was actually when it was probably May. Um, we, we decided to go with Shopify. And, um, so we had someone build our site and, you know, they used a theme, built our site, literally took on like two weeks and, uh, we went up and running. And the nice thing is, is, before our inventories didn't mesh. So I would actively have to go in and look at the sales from that day and then take it out of inventory prior to Shopify, Mm -hmm. which was the biggest pain in the world. And, um, you know, when we decided to not focus so much online, I think prior it was because we we weren't seeing sales because, again, our site wasn't mobile-friendly, there was so many other sites. Our, our site scrolled left to right for some reason because I think we thought it was really cool instead of up and down, which was super confusing for people. Um, so, yeah, we definitely took a hiatus. There was still stuff up there, but we weren't focused on it. Um, whereas as soon as June hit, and this is when I started getting help, um, as soon as June hit, I, you know, I hired this amazing group of women to help me with my marketing and PR and all that stuff. And they kind of came in and helped me, you know, build this beautiful site that I'm absolutely obsessed with now. And we've had it ever since. And so since then, I mean, we've really grown online versus what we were before. I mean, I don't think there even is a percentage of what we're selling online versus what we're selling in the store. Um, 
I do think that we missed the mark a little bit. So five years ago, I think that, you know, like I've said, we weren't, it wasn't a crazy thing to be online. It wasn't the thing to do. And I think probably like six months later, it started to blow up a little bit. And I think if we probably would have stayed with it, it would have been better. But for the simple fact that we weren't mobile, we would have had to pay for, I think it was like a crazy number. I think it was like $6,000 or something at the time to have them code it in and make it mobile friendly. I mean, it was just crazy. So it just made sense for us to completely trash the website that we had, which broke my heart. And because it cost so much money to get a new site. Um, so that was the huge transition we made, um, a little over a year ago was to give up on what we had that wasn't working, wasn't making money, wasn't doing what it needed to do to switch. And I had to bite that bullet and, I mean, I'm happy I did, but that was, yeah, that was the huge thing of switching from e-commerce to kiosk, from kiosk to brick and mortar, from brick and mortar back to e-commerce, back to brick and mortar. I mean, it's just been this huge um, cycle, and I feel like now we're kind of, it's evened out a little bit. <laughs> we're starting to get in a groove. So how, how about the transition from the uh, the e-commerce side more to opening the brick and mortar for the first time? Like what were things that you maybe not missed along the way, but like what were some of the issues that might come up that you might want to, I guess, shed light to for other entrepreneurs that are thinking about opening a, up a physical store? Yeah. So the whole reason why I didn't want to open up a physical store in the first place because I was thinking overhead. I was thinking overhead is just crazy. Mm. And it just doesn't make any sense. And, you know, I can just do this from home. And the thing is, and this is now, not then, um, we weren't seeing the sales online that we needed to to have just an e-commerce store. So I knew that the overhead was going to be higher, but I also knew I could not figure out at the time how to get more customers online. And also, again, I was doing this all by myself. I didn't have any help from anybody. I didn't really know anything about social media as far as, like, websites and stuff like that. Um, I absolutely knew nothing about coding. Um, So switching from the complete e-commerce to the in-store, it was definitely a financial switch because I knew, A, we needed capital, and I knew, B, we needed customers. And so I think... Looking back, I wish that I would have started off brick and mortar over e-commerce and built it. Because let's be honest, I started it backwards. A lot of people don't do it that way. Um, they don't, you know, start e-commerce and then open up a store. That's not that's not super common. It's usually they start a store, decide to go e-commerce, get rid of their storefront. Mm-hmm. So since we switched, we created we created a brand, I want to call it. We created a lifestyle here. So we have a look about us. So it's been a long time coming. And it's really, the one thing that I focused on is being as as authentic and original as possible as far as building this business. So I don't pay for likes. I don't pay for customers. I don't pay for lists, anything like that. Um, We definitely have done word of mouth from day one. And I think that's why our growth has been slower, but I feel like we definitely have more authentic customers because of that. So if, again, if I had to do it all over again, I wish I would have done the storefront from the beginning. Um, Now you see so many online stores. It's like everyone and their dog has opened up an online store. Um, It doesn't even matter what it is. Um, whether it's jewelry or clothing or whatever it is, e-commerce is such a huge thing. But I do think that people want to shop now for a lifestyle. They want, like, if you go to Instagram, I feel like now you don't go and look at a, you know, a picture of a top and it says thirty four ninety nine under and you click on it. You go and you look at a blogger. And you see how the blogger wore it and you click on that blogger and you, you know, you buy it that way. And so what we wanted to do, I think, and what made me change my mind is we wanted to create, we wanted to create a place where people could physically go if they wanted to, where, you know, there was a look behind it. 
where it was more believable. We didn't want to put off that perception that we were out of an apartment or we were out of a garage. You know what I mean? And so I think that was the huge transition is, crap, we do look like that. We don't look legitimate at all, and that's not what I want. And so coming in the store, I think, helped build this lifestyle and build this look and build, um, you know, and our marketing team really, really helped with that, too, as far as, like, our, our online um our Instagram and our Facebook is, um, people, people want to buy into, buy into a lifestyle. They don't want to just buy clothes anymore because you can go anywhere and buy clothes. You can go to any e-commerce, you can just type it in Google. And so I think, um, the big thing for us was, and I think why we've been successful up until this point, because that has been a focus. Um, so we wanted to be, you know, more like an anthropology and less like a, I mean, H&M obviously is, successful so i'm not thinking that but like a forever 21 like that wasn't our focus um yeah, yeah makes sense so uh, this this idea of creating a lifestyle i think you mentioned this previously too i think in the pre-interview where you said that you are you focus on creating a lifestyle instead of just pushing a product and this idea of creating a lifestyle first um it's i wouldn't say just recently popular but it's been shown to be a much more su- successful and much more defensible way to build a brand so how does it actually play out on like a day-to-day basis like when you wake up um, your to-do list uh, doesn't probably doesn't say you know, keep on building a lifestyle, right? Like, what is it on a day-to-day basis? How do you make sure you maintain this lifestyle? <laughs> so, okay, so how this whole thing started off, and this is this is how the whole lifestyle idea kicked off, is um, we've done, and this was kind of just an idea of mine, is I wanted to do these killer lookbooks, and I wanted people to see, you know, see a small company that can do such like vivid, beautiful pictures that you would see on Shop Rouge, that you'd see on Anthropology, that you'd see on Free People. We wanted to do that. And so I came up with this idea um, prior to getting a new website that we wanted to make this look um, how it feels to us. So we wanted people to look at pictures and be like, wow, that is so cool. And so I think that's kind of how it started was, um, I think our first lookbook, um, my mom and I were, were very handy. So we like do it yourself projects and stuff like that. So we wanted to show that we wanted to show, you know, how creative, um, our store is and, you know, not only what to expect from a store, but what to expect from our clothing. So we created this huge thing of, um, it was like a gypsy tent and we did these, I mean, if you go on a couple sites, like they have our pictures up there and I don't think they even know that like, those are our pictures. I'm pretty sure they just pulled them off the internet. But, um, so that was a huge thing. And as soon as we released this lookbook and I had this idea of, you know, doing these wild horses and, having this whole entire look of, you know, the wild child and the free spirit. And, um, ever since we did that people, we just had such feedback on how beautiful it was. And, you know, they loved the pictures and they loved the look. So after we kind of got that feedback, it was like, okay, like people want to see that they want to see a cute style girl either, you know, going about her life or, you know, posed with a pretty background people want to see that versus someone just hanging out you know what I mean like against a white wall granted you have to have those photos especially for online so that's kind of how the whole lifestyle aspect started and so then we started to grow every season and it was like okay what lookbook are we going to do this year and people started looking forward to our lookbooks and then um if you've ever everyone who's going to listen to this needs to Google, um, the Badlands. So the Badlands of South Dakota is by far the most beautiful place. I honestly would say, I mean, I've never traveled the whole entire world, but it's gotta be top five. So, um, it's, it's this beautiful atmosphere. And so that was the next one. And, you know, we did a shoot with like a Jeep and kind of made it this cool rugged look, but it's still, these girls are wearing clothes that are from the store. These aren't like super fancy clothes. We're just showing, you know, a cool way to style an outfit with a killer background. And so then, you know, that slowly led into bloggers. So, okay, what bloggers should we work with? What girls can we get these clothes on? Stuff like that. So every once in a while, we started seeing, you know, people wearing our clothes, tagging us in our clothes. And then we're like, okay, well, now we're going to push people, you know, tag us in your clothes. We want to see how you style it. We want to see your life 
in our clothing. And so I think slowly but surely, I mean, this has been going on for a couple of years. We, we started to create this look and people, you know, girls now, we have these girls called coquettes. So a lot of the coquettes you'll see um, are models on our site. And they're just, again, they're regular girls just live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And um, they want to be a part of it. They want to be coquettes. They want to do the looks. Um, and that's what our goal was. We want people to see not only clothes, but we want them to see the creative artistic side of it all. And so honestly, that was my biggest win. And like, like it's super weird because people who are truly entrepreneurs, and I'm not saying I'm like the coolest entrepreneur ever, like you get inspired by weird things. So for instance, like Alvin and the Chipmunks, like that movie from like 1985 or something, I was inspired for a photo shoot <laughs> by Alvin and the Chipmunks one night when I was watching it with my nephews. I mean, weird things like that. So just, I mean, taking something that I love and I want to recreate with something that was really cool for us and people really, really responded. And so it turned into not just clothing for us. It turned into, you know, people wanted to be involved with us and wanted to be friends with us and wanted to wear us. Um, for that specific reason. So mm-hmm. so this all comes down to, a lot, seems like a lot of it is around photography. So is that the style yeah. or is that the goal of the Instagram? Is that the strategy to create this oh, yeah. lifestyle look in the Instagram? And then do, are you also working with influencers on Instagram too? Like tell us about your strategy on the on Instagram. So we were working with influencers for a while. Um, we were working with, you know, some bloggers and we were doing some smaller ones. We did some, you know, really you know, up and coming ones that were really, really great. Um, but from what we found, honestly, it's mostly our photography is what sells and what gets people to, you know, our site. So if you go to our site, a lot of our, you know, models are white background, but if you go to our Instagram, it is, it's, we try to have pretty pictures. We try to have, um, you know, women in their everyday lives. We, we try to do, um, like a, we call them lifestyle photos. So a woman at a coffee shop wearing something or, um, you know, things like that are things that we love. And so I think for a while bloggers were huge and influence were huge and, you know, like to know it. It's still big, but I don't think people necessarily were buying off that. They just, like had girl crushes. Like I have so many bloggers that I follow. I'm like, Oh my gosh, you're so pretty. Be my best friend. (laughs) Um, and, but nobody was buying. So we have definitely backed off from that. We still occasionally will use, you know, a couple. Um, but we mostly just focus on being what we think, um, people would like. So, you know, I think everyone likes seeing someone who's not a model and not, not absolutely perfect wearing, you know, clothes because it makes them feel like, okay, I'm not a model either. I can wear that. I'm not a size zero either. I can wear that. So I think that was the big thing that, you know, we've done and we've tried to focus on is um, putting pretty clothes on, you know, everyday women who are, who are just as beautiful. And I think that helps people who see our page are like, okay, like I can wear that. Um, So the biggest thing that, you know, I think, the lifestyle and, you know, Instagram and our bloggers and everything like that comes back to is just relatability. And I think Coquette is just very, very relatable. And it's something that you want to, it, it's a feel good brand. It's a feel good look. Um, and I think that's, that's something that we've definitely done right. And I think, um, there's so much planning that, you know, our, my, my girls at the Samson house do and the go into just an Instagram post. I mean, you have to worry about the copy and the tags and, and, and the hashtags. And there's just so much that goes into it. Um, so that's something that I would definitely tell people if you want to get into retail is you need to get into the social media aspect of it. Um, you really, really need to master that. Because if you can master that, um, I mean, you can have someone do sales if you don't want to do sales and you love to style. You, you That's what I mean uh, going back to you know, finding your niche, finding what you're good at and really killing it there. Um, just because you don't like sales doesn't mean you can't necessarily do a store. That's not it at all. Um, because especially online, like you don't really talk to anybody. Um, let's be honest. It's not like you really have to sit face to face with somebody, but yeah, I would say 
the more relatable you are, the more people who are going to shop you. Mm-hmm. Makes I think. sense. So, what do you have planned? Uh, what are your goals for the for the next year? Oh gosh. Um, so right now, as far as online, we're really just trying to focus on growth. Um, I'd say right now we're about twenty five percent. Um, and just even last month, 25% of our sales came from just online, um, versus our store, um, which our store, it's obviously the moneymaker for us. So I'd love to push that in the next six months to a year up to at least 50, if not 75. Um, we are going to be moving locations. So, um, our actual storefront is going to be moving and we're kind of moving into a, a cool, hip area of Sioux Falls and, you know, it kind of fits our look and that's kind of what we're focusing on. Um, so yeah, I'd really, really love, like I would be the happiest girl in the world if honestly online was supporting in store. Like I wouldn't care about that. I would probably be jumping up and down and I don't know, (laughs) buying everyone puppies or something. Nice. Awesome. So thanks so much, Kayleen. So coquettecouture.com again is the website. Anywhere else you recommend the listeners check out, they want to follow along with uh, you know, what you're up to the next uh, next while? Yeah, just follow us on Instagram. Um, Instagram is a great way um, for you know followers to see what we're up to and see where we're at and what we're doing. And that's, that's the best way probably to get a hold of us. Cool. So it's the same as the website, Coquette Couture. Again, C-O-Q-U-E-T-T-E-C-O-U-T-U-R-E. And that will be linked in the show notes too. So I uh, don't have to uh, remember, remember that or anything. Uh, awesome. Again, thanks so much for your time, Kayleen. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening to Shopify Masters, the e-commerce marketing podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs. To start your store today, visit shopify.com slash masters to claim your extended 30-day free trial.